All right, if you have your Bibles, open it up to the book of Revelation. That's the very last book in the Bible. We have just last week started a series through the book of Revelation, and uh, we're excited to be going through it. If you don't have a Bible and you need one, there's one in the pew in front of you. You can also open up the YouVersion Bible app to the events section on your smartphone or tablet and follow along there as well with the scriptures and some of the notes. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 is where we're going to be starting at uh, together today. My name is Cody. I'm the pastor here at Redemption, and it's my honor, my privilege to serve you in the scriptures every week. I'm so grateful that God allows me uh, to be able to do this, to be able to uh, deliver his word to you, and I'm excited to look at it together today. Uh, my family and I, we have uh, two dogs. I don't know where you're at on the dog spectrum of things, uh, but in our family, cats are evil and dogs are glorious. Uh, and so, yeah, some of you are like, I just, I hate you now. And uh, so, oh, that's all right. It's because you're a cat person. Um, so, I'm just kidding. All right. Rough crowd. All right, anyway, so we have two dogs, all right? So, and we have, uh, the dogs that we have are the same breed. Uh, we love this breed, uh, and you're going to make more fun of me when you're like, you're going to say, it's not a dog, bro. Uh, they are Shih Tzu Yorkies, or Shorkies. Uh, they're very little. They, they will never get above five pounds. They're very little dogs, and we love them because they are really uh, playful and fun, but they're also super cuddly. Uh, they, you know, when I sit, I sit on the couch, they just want to sit like kind of on you and just hang out with you. I, I just love that about our dogs. Well, the we had one, and then we decided to get another one, and we named this new one. We got it last year around Mother's Day. We decided to name it Chewy uh, after Chewbacca because the other one, Star Wars, if you, if you didn't know that. So after a Star Wars character, because the other one also had a Star Wars name. And so we decided to name this one Chewy. And we didn't know this was going to be prophetic, that the dog chews everything. Uh, and so, you know, it just chews every. So we can't give this dog uh, fabric toys because it'll chew them up and eat them. And then it has digestive issues. And it's just... It's no fun. Um, so we have, we've got to get hard stuff, things hard enough to survive her chewing. And so we have a bunch of different bone and stick shaped things all over our house. And, you know, one of the things about that is that, you know, we have these things, they have a bunch of bite marks in them and they're all over the home. And, uh, you know, when you are trying to, you know, walk across a dark room in the middle of the night, finding one of these things with your foot is like Legos on steroids. Like these things will, you might die. And so you have to really, do I want to take the risk of going across this dark room uh, in order to do this? Uh, you know, and, and the thing is that having a vision and experience with Jesus is a lot like turning the lights on. That, that's what it's like when you see Jesus, when you experience his presence. It's like turning the lights on. All of a sudden, you can see all of the landmines in your way. It reorients your entire life. And at that moment, when that happens, you can't help but spend your life dedicated completely to him. That, that there's just this thing that resonates within you that you can't help but say, I want my whole life to be dedicated to Jesus. C.S. Lewis said it like this, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And those of you who have experienced a relationship with Jesus whereby he has saved you through his death, burial, and resurrection, that you get that. You get the idea that I used to not be able to see correctly, and then because Jesus shined his light, not only on my soul, but into the world, everything else finds its right purpose and right meaning because of him. You see, the glory and goodness of Jesus, that he's all-powerful God, and he's lovingly compassionate to you and me. This shifts the paradigm in life. You see, without Jesus, nothing really makes sense. We try to go through life and make sense of things and try to figure it all out. And why, is, why are there problems and issues in the world? And what, what's going on in the world? And none of it really makes sense. But when Jesus in, is in his right place, all of the what in the world is supported with the why of who Jesus really is. And that's kind of what we're looking at together today in Re Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 through 20. It's this. The big idea is a supernatural experience with King Jesus always results in serving him. That's just the way that it goes. 
There's no other response but to say, now my life needs to be given to you. The, everything that I do is reoriented. Why do I love my wife the way that I love her? Why do I raise my kids the way that I raise them? Why do I spend my money the way that I spend it? Why do I serve at the church the way that I do? Why do I, why do, I do the things in my life and, and give and serve and, and live the things that, in my life the way that I do? Well, it's all because of Jesus and I'm actually serving him. When, when everything in life is that way, the way I go to work, the way that I interact with uh, strangers, when it's all toward Jesus, it changes and shifts everything. So let's read Revelation 1, 9 through 20. It's a kind of a, a longer section. We'll read it all together, and then we'll go back through and break it down. Revelation 1, 9 says this, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down uh, about, excuse me, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am, the, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. Uh, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Let's pray. Father, we Thank you for the opportunity to open your word together today, and we ask that you would give us understanding. We pray that as we look upon your word, that we would see you for who you really are. God, we have all sorts of ideas about who we think you should be, or the, the uh, preconceived notions of, of the way that uh, we, we think life should go, or whatever that is, and we want to lay all that aside and lay it down and say, God, would you reorient everything? Would you help us to see life the way that you designed it? Would you help us to see you for who you really are? And then would you set us on a course to honor and love and follow you? And so we pray that you would do that work among us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today we're going to be breaking down this section into three parts. Revelation 1, 19 through 20. Verses 9 through 11, John hears Jesus. The second piece, 12 through 16, John sees Jesus. And then the third piece, uh, 17 through 20, John serves Jesus. Now, here's the reality. Many people are seeking a supernatural experience for the sake of a supernatural experience. That there's this, this thing that's happening where people are pursuing some sort of thing. That if you go to church and you don't get the Holy Ghost goosebumps, then it's because Vince picked the wrong songs. Like, dude, you got to do better. And just, you know, like there's this thing where it's like, if I don't do that, then, and then when you try to say something to, about that to somebody, then they go, well, you must be wrong. Something's wrong with you're in sin because you didn't feel something in the presence of God, or he didn't move, or it's not a spirit-filled church if people aren't running around yelling things, right? That there's this sense of an experience for the sake of the experience, that that's what a lot of people are wrapped up within. And, and the idea is that people want to see something or feel something cool. And I understand that idea, that there's this desire to see, you know, you read about the miracles in the Bible, you're like, well, let's see some of that stuff. Or, you know, you see some of the, the ways that God moves, you're like, I want to feel some of that stuff. Or perhaps you felt something previously and you want to feel that again. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but... 
Jesus points us to something deeper than that. In fact, it's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted from Jesus in Matthew chapter 16. You know, they, they said, uh, came testing him and they were asking him uh, if they would, that he, they would show him them a sign. That's what they were looking for from Jesus. And Jesus' reply is this in Matthew 16, 4, only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. Then Jesus left them and went away. You see, Jesus condemned that idea that you're just seeking after signs, just wanting to experience supernatural things just to experience supernatural things. The vision and experience with Jesus that you and I need is to see his cross and empty tomb and to experience the resurrected life that he lives in and through his people. That's the miracle that you and I need to experience. Now, there may be other things that take place, but that's not what we're to seek after. It's Jesus who we look after. You see, I'm not concerned with so much with how high you can jump as I am with how straight you can walk. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. When you live a life that honors and glorifies God, that's the strength and power of the Holy Spirit in your life, not necessarily being able to experience or perform supernatural things. So let's look at this first section together. John, hears Jesus in verses 9 through 11. Look back at verse 9. It says this, I, John, both brother and companion in the tribulation and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. John goes back here in this moment to his introduction. He's, he's referencing back to what happened in verse 4. He already introduced himself. He said his name's John in verse 4. But then as he started to think about Jesus, he explodes with all of this worship that just comes out of him. He just starts talking about this amazing vision of Jesus that he sees. You see, John experiences all of chapter one before writing it. That's what takes place. And we see that as, you know, as it unfolds, basically he, Jesus tells him to write stuff and instead of writing stuff, he passes out. And so Jesus has to wake him up and say, hey, bro, write some stuff down. And, and, and so, you know, he's kind of going back over this. And as he's considering what he's just seen, he, he says, I'm John. And then he goes, but let's talk about Jesus for a minute. And he just explodes with worship and then comes back to introducing himself. And, and so John, who is this guy? Well, he's one of the 12 men who spent three years with Jesus. He was one of the three men that were in Jesus' inner circle, Peter, James, and John, the guys he w- that Jesus would take away and uh, he would show them significant things or spend spe- specific time with them. He was one of those guys. He was, he was one of the guys, the only one of the 12 who were at the cross when Jesus was crucified. The only one. The, the rest of them all left. Je- John was there. And he was also the one who leaned on Jesus' chest at the last dinner. That's John. He's also the one from the cross. Jesus told him, hey, take care of Mary, my mom. When I die, I want you to take care of her. This is who John is. John has this very close, very intimate relationship with Jesus. And if anyone could elevate themselves by credential, it's John. He could, he could cite all this stuff. Hey, check out all of the reasons why you, sh- me, I'm up here. You, you're down here. This is me. I'm awesome. You're regular. Look at all the cool stuff I got to do with Jesus and how he chose me. You, don't, you didn't even spend any time with him. Look at you down here. He could do this and yet he doesn't. Look at how he identifies himself in two very humble ways. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion. Your brother and your companion. Brother, this is family language, that God is the father, that he is uh, above all, and that John is just one of the brothers. He's not ascribing to himself any undue authority. He's, he's saying, Jesus is way up there, and all the rest of us are down here. Not, he's not making levels of access to God, that somehow there are certain people who are closer to God than the rest of us, that we're all at the same level, that the ground at the foot of the cross is level for all of us. It doesn't go up a hill in that way. There's no undue authority that he takes. But he also not only says brother, but he says companion. This is not family language, but friendship language. That God is the Lord and and that John's just one of the friends. That, That he doesn't elevate himself. He says he's not going to usurp God's authority. He's just going to submit to God's authority. It's a tremendous thing that takes place here as John could very easily exalt himself, but he chooses not to. Instead, he chooses to put himself in a humble state. Now, 
There is a whole lot that I could say about just those two words. And, and maybe what I'll do is, uh, you know, re- write some stuff out for it or whatever and, and write an article about it. But here, I'll just give you this, okay? This is the way that every good relationship works. Every good relationship works with these two thoughts. The idea of family, uh, the family relationship, and the friend relationship. Here's how it works. That there, is, there needs to be face-to-face time that you have with people. That's kind of that family kind of a thing. But there also needs to be shoulder-to-shoulder type relationship that you have with people. That it's not just face-to-face. Otherwise, you become emotionally drained, right? Whenever it's face-to-face, there's usually one person that's unloading and one person that's taking, right? If you're not the one that's taking, you're probably the other one. And so people are like, gosh, I don't know if I want to talk to you face-to-face that much anymore. All right, so there's that. There's also shoulder-to-shoulder where you do stuff together. You, you actually accomplish things together. You're, it's, not, it's not necessarily uh, face-to-face relationally. It's shoulder-to-shoulder relationally. Every good relationship has both of those. If it's just shoulder-to-shoulder and it's, there's no face-to-face, it's shallow. You may like them and like to hang out with them, but you don't really know them. All right, so here, here's what's going on with John. He says, I'm, the, I'm your brother and your companion. Again, there's a lot more we could say, but I'm just going to keep moving. Matthew 23, 9 through 11, uh, Jesus says this, And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your father. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be a servant. Jesus shifts the paradigm of what greatness is. And in the world, it's, it's all about who's higher and who can climb higher and how many people serve them. But in the kingdom of God, it's different. How many people do you serve is the greatness, uh, the measure of greatness in the kingdom of God. And John, so John identifies himself that way and he says, I was on the island that is called Patmos. Now they would immediately get this. They would get this idea immediately. It's like if I was to say, I was on the island Alcatraz when it was a prison island, and you would immediately understand exactly what that is because you, under, you know what it is. The, the same thing is true for them that day that he was on this island of Patmos, this prison island of the Roman empire. And he tells us why. Notice he says there, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. That most theologians would say that what this means is that he's there because of persecution. That because of, it wasn't that he was a criminal and he was, you know, defaming the name of Jesus, but it's instead that he was living a godly life and proclaiming the gospel. And because he was telling and teaching God's word, they put him in prison for it, that this is what's taking place with John. Now notice uh, uh, the, in verse 10 what's taking place here. He's on this island because of persecution. And he says in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now the, this phrase, in the spirit, it's to be carried beyond the normal. That it's, it's not just this normal idea of walking in the Spirit like we see in Galatians chapter 5, but it's something deeper than that. It's this supernatural state that he's in, a significantly different thing that's taking place where the Holy Spirit is, is uh, uh, putting him in this position to see something different. That if you want to see the Lord and experience his power, then you need the presence of the Holy Spirit with you. You see, we can't create these moments. We don't, we don't create them to say that I want to have this kind of a thing, but we can position ourselves in such a way, such a posture that we are ready when Jesus wants to bring these moments into our lives. And we do that with two things. One, humility by not exalting yourself, but humbly submitting to the things of the Lord. But, and secondly, proximity being with the Lord, being next to the Lord. It's, he says there, I was in the spirit. Notice the second idea, on the Lord's day, on the Lord's day. This is a phrase that was commonly used for today, Sunday. The Lord's day is what this day is called. And the reason it's called that is because this is the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead. That's why we do church on Sunday. We don't do church on Sunday because it's the last day of the week. We actually do church on Sunday because it's the first day of the week. I know that's maybe weird for you because of our language. We call this the weekend, but that's not what it is. Sunday is the first day of the week. That's the day that Jesus raised from the dead, and that's why we give this whole day to him. 
We come together to worship him, to exalt him, to glorify him, to study his word, to, to, to give him our praise because we want to set our entire week on the trajectory of worship to the Lord. That's why we gather on Sundays, commemorating his resurrection and giving our very best to him. We start our week with worship. And so here he is in the spirit. Why? Because he's humble, he's submitted to the Lord, and he's in proximity to the Lord. He's worshiping on the Lord's day, uh, similar to what we are doing here today. Notice what happens, verse 11. He hears this loud trumpet, trumpeting voice saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, and then he lists the names of those churches. Now, Jesus here speaks with unmistakable power and clarity. That's why he says, like a trumpet. He didn't hear a trumpet. It wasn't, burr, burr, burr. you know, that's not what he heard. He heard the clarity and power of a trumpet. That, that's what's taking place here. He's liking it, likening it to the idea of the way that a trumpet sounds. And, and then what does he do? Well, Jesus, as he speaks, he repeats part of verse 8 and his introduction. He says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Jesus has already said this, but he repeats this because his eternality is what is central to grasping what's about to take place. That Jesus was before the beginning and he will continue after the end. That's what Jesus is communicating here. What he's, what he's, what's not happening is that Jesus came into human existence when he was born. That's, that's not what Jesus started. That's how all of us have started and everyone else in human history has started, including all of the leaders of other religious movements. They all began their life with their birth, but not Jesus. He's totally different. He's in a category unto himself. He is God who then steps into human history as a baby. What an amazing thing. Isaiah 44, 6 says this, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Look at that verse real quick. It says, it's, it says this, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel. So this is God the Father speaking, but then it says this, And his Redeemer. That's very clearly uh, pointing to who Jesus is, the Redeemer, the Messiah. So God the Son is being elevated here to being uh, equal, co-equal with God the Father. Even the Old Testament, Jesus, his Redeemer, is elevated to be equal with God the Father. Now, here's the thing. When we look at this idea of the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, Alpha, the first alpha, uh, letter in the alphabet of the Greek language, Omega, the last letter in the alphabet of the Greek language. It means that he's there before and he'll be, he'll be there after. And most Christians don't struggle with the idea of God being there in the beginning, right? You read Genesis and it was in the beginning God. And you go, okay, got it. And then you read the very end and you go like, all right, God exists after. Right? God exists in heaven. We don't really struggle with that too much. But what we do struggle with is the middle. That's where we struggle, we struggle with God and his presence being with us, especially when things aren't going the way that we thought or hoped. And then we start to wonder, God, are you there? Do you even care? Do you have any awareness of what's happening in life right now? Can you see the pain and suffering in the world? Can you see the thing that I'm struggling with? Can you see the stuff that's taking place? And we struggle with it. Why? Because it doesn't seem as though God does the stuff that we think he should. But the truth is that when God says, when Jesus here says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, he's not just saying he's the beginning and the end. He's saying, I'm, I'm also over all of it in the middle as well. That Jesus is over all. John Corson says it like this, God is in control. God is on the throne. The same God who did the work in the beginning is here in the middle and will come through in the end. That's who he is, and that's how Jesus is introducing himself. And so he says, I want you to write this stuff down, and I want you to send it to these churches, these seven churches in Asia. Again, this is Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. It's not China. It's not Korea. It's not Japan. It's not the Philippines. It's, it's modern-day Turkey. And we're going to look at these churches with more, uh, more closely starting next week, but suffice it, suffice it to say that uh, Jesus wants these letters sent to those, this one letter sent to those seven 
churches, right? Secondly, not only do we see that John hears Jesus, but we see that John sees Jesus in verses 12 through 16. Look at verse 12. It says this, then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Like, so, so here's what's happening here in this section. Think of it like a movie. It's like cinematography. The, the very first thing that they do when you're watching a movie is they show you a wide shot, don't they? They set the scene. They show you a wide shot of here's kind of the, 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 the place where it's at. Or maybe if you're watching a, a sitcom, a TV show, before they show anything else going on inside the house, you know what they show you? They show you a shot of the house from the street. Right? So that way, mentally, you get the idea that it's in this house. And then you go where? Into the living room or the kitchen or something. And that's the more narrow shot. And then there's a close-up where there's some detail that they want you to see. That's exactly what's happening here with John. He's giving us a wide shot and then a more narrow shot and then a close-up. That's what's taking place with this vision of Jesus. The wide shot sets the scene. And then John, he turns to see the voice and he's completely unprepared for what he's about to see. Now, Jesus doesn't want John to miss this, so he actually gives us the interpretation to two critical components of this vision in verse 20, all right? Now, usually I would wait till verse 20 to tell you that, but I can't because I'm about to tell you what it means, and I'm going to tell you what it means based on what Jesus says it means. So we're going to reference verse 20. And what this basically means to us, this is is really important, is that this whole vision that John sees, it's imagery of stuff that isn't, uh, you shouldn't take it literally. That's essentially what's taking place here. That when you see Jesus with a sword coming out of his mouth, it doesn't mean he's like a buccaneer and he's got a sword in his mouth and he's like swinging on a rope or something. That's, that's not what it is. It's imagery of something else, okay? So that's what's taking place because uh, of what's, what's happening here. And Jesus shows us that. All right, so uh, the first thing that we see, this wide shot in verse 12 there, is he turns around and what does he see? Well, John doesn't even see Jesus. He sees seven golden lampstands. Now, a Jewish mind in reading this, they would immediately think of the menorah. When you, when you hear of a golden lampstand, their immediate thought would be the menorah. You know what the menorah is, right? It's that, that lampstand. It's, the, it's got one big tall uh, stand, and then it's got two of those kind of U-shaped things. So there's seven branches on the, the lampstand. They would immediately think of that, and they would say, this reminds me of that, but also it's not like that. It's, it's both. It's, 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 it's both like it and not like it. It's a connection to and deviation from the menorah because the menorah is one lampstand with seven branches. And if you look here, it's actually seven individual lampstands. So it's very, very different as to what is taking place. Now, we said this before, but I'll repeat it again here as we're looking at seven. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. Right, remember that? So the seven churches, yes, there are seven individual churches that are mentioned here, but there are also other churches that aren't mentioned here that are in Asia Minor that are significant churches. One of them, for example, is the Church of Colossae. That's in Turkey. It's in Asia Minor. It's not in this letter. It's not in this list, but it's a significant church. It even has its own book of the Bible. And so this isn't necessarily these individual churches, though they are referenced and though they are specific. It's to say that this seven is the whole church. It's the church in total. It's, it's even us today throughout all of time. Matthew Poole says it like this. In the Jewish tabernacle, tabernacle there, there was one golden candlestick and seven lamps to give light. John here seeth seven, and God had but one church of the Jews, but many among the Gentiles. See, see the imagery there? It's, it's this one lampstand for the Jews, but it's individual lampstands, seven of them, that there are many churches uh, across the world. Now, these seven lampstands are arranged a certain way. Look at verse 13. It says this, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. These seven lampstands are are arranged sort of in maybe a circle. Uh, Somehow they're arranged in a way that Jesus can be in the middle of the lampstand. See, the midst of, that means he's in the middle of them. It doesn't mean that he's in the middle of the stick. It means that they're arranged around him is what this is, this is uh, telling us. And so uh, Jesus is standing in the middle of them and he's dressed in a certain way. This is our narrow shot, 
right? We have a wide shot of these lampstands, and now we're getting a little bit more of a narrow shot. We're looking at Jesus, and he's dressed a certain way. Notice it says that he has this, uh, uh, he's, dr- he's dressed down, covered all the way down to the, the feet, having a um, uh, clothed with a garment. It's this idea of a tunic. It'd be very, sim- very common clothing in this time. But what this is imagery of is the, actually the high priest. What he's seeing here is Jesus as the high priest in Exodus chapter 28. The long tunic is the idea of authority and prominence, also the idea of not working. It's part of what uh, God wanted the priests to wear because there was no work they could do in their own salvation, that they were recipients of salvation from God, not working for it in order to earn God's favor. And also the high priest would have a, uh, a band around his chest. But uh, let me make sure I get this right. Um, Exodus chapter 39 actually talks about how the, the band of the high priest would have uh, uh, threads of gold through it. But notice Jesus's, it's pure gold. So he's like the high priest, except the, the more fulfilled version of the high priest. He's the greater than the high priest. He's the, the high priest of the high priests. And one of the priest's duties in the Old Testament was to tend to the menorah. They would keep it clean. They would fill it with oil and they would keep it burning brightly. Jesus is the high priest attending to his church. Do you see the imagery? That, that there's these seven candlesticks around and the seven candlesticks represent the church. That's what Jesus says there in verse 20. The, the, um, the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So the, the, the candlesticks, the lampstands, they represent the church and Jesus is in the middle of them and he's dressed like the high priest. So he's attending to his church. He's the centerpiece of his church. He's the one attending to his church. And also, here's something that's really important to grasp. Lampstands don't have light in and of themselves. They are exactly what it sounds like, a stand that holds a lamp. It's just a golden stick that stands. That's all it does. And then you would put a lamp on it. That's, that's what it's for. And so there are these lampstands that are the churches, but they don't have light in and of themselves. They need that light to be provided by Jesus. And how does Jesus provide that light? Well, think about an, an, a lamp. The, the oil lamps of, uh, of this time period, they would require oil and flame. That's how, you get, that's how you get light, right? In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is described with both of these ideas. The oil of the Holy Spirit, the flame of the Holy Spirit that comes uh, in Acts chapter 2. And so the Holy Spirit is what's needed in order for us to have light But Jesus is the one who attends to it and gives this light to us. Here's how Jesus said it in John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. See, Jesus says the helper, the Holy Spirit, has to come to you. And so he's the one who sends the Holy Spirit to bring the oil, to bring the the fire to, burn, to cause the light to burn bright within his church. All right, so now we have some other descriptors in verses 14 through 16 uh, given of Jesus. It's the close-up. That's what we got here. There's some close-up shots of Jesus, and each of these things has something significant with it. Notice verse 14. It says this, His head and hair were white uh, like wool, as white as snow. This, this idea of his head and hair being white Uh, is the idea of, yeah, like having white hair. It's the idea of age. Uh, But in this this time, uh, the idea of age wasn't something that was viewed the same then as it is now. In in our day, our culture doesn't really honor age. In fact, everyone's trying to get younger all the time. That's why plastic surgery is on the rise. Botox is on the rise. Some sort of, there's always a cream or lotion to rub on something and it's supposed to make you younger, right? That's, That's the whole point. And uh, the, the truth is that in this time, they actually valued and honored age in a very distinct and different way. And so, yes, the idea of white here speaks of age, but it's not that God is old and feeble, that Jesus is old and feeble, but that his, his age has brought with him wisdom and ability that you don't have with youth. 
That, that he, is, he is ageless and yet he is the ancient one is the idea that's being portrayed here. But also the idea of white. Notice it's like wool, like, like snow. This is also purity that's being established for us there as well. The second image we see is that not only was his, was his hair white, but also his eyes are like a flame of fire. This idea of the eyes of being a flame of fire, it's the searching, penetrating judgment of Jesus. That's the idea of fire. Fire in the Bible is always this concept of judgment that is coming. And, and so where does the judgment come from? The, the piercing, searching, penetrating gaze of Jesus. I can't help when I read this, but to think of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, where it says that we will have to give an account of our lives before the Lord. And then it says that our lives will be judged as by fire as by fire. I can't help but connect these ideas and to say, I wonder if the fire of judgment that my life will go through and that your life will go through is the fire of judgment of Jesus's gazing stare across your life. And we're told in 1 Corinthians 3 that you have two categories of things that your life fits into. It's either gold and silver and precious stones, or it's wood, hay, and stubble. It's one or the other. That's the category of all the stuff of your life, all of your thoughts, all of your actions, all of your words, all of the ways that you use and spend your life. It's going to fit into one of those two categories. The only way, well, well here's one thought. When you put fire on gold, it's not consumed. It's purified. When you put fire on wood, it's consumed. And so, so when I look at that and I think, God, what parts of my life are just going to be completely consumed, completely destroyed. I thought they were so valuable. I pursued so much of this in my life, and yet for, to you, it means nothing. I, I invested so much into it, and it just, it's gone. But what about other things in my life? How, how, do, I, how do I use my life to get this gold and silver and precious stones? Well, that's only possible by faith in Jesus. It's when your life is committed to Jesus as Lord, God, and Savior, that's the only way to get the gold and silver and precious stones. It's not by doing good things. It's not by, by uh, sacrificing and giving up and, and trying to, to make yourself better uh, or trying to advance yourself in some sort of good way. No, it's by faith alone in Jesus alone. All right. This third idea we have, verse 15, it says this, his feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace. Okay, so we're, we're back with the idea of fire, but it's different. It says feet, his feet look like bronze. Uh, it's like brass, but it's not just brass. It's, it's like they're gl glowing almost because they've been refined by the fire. Here's the idea. Jesus, well, okay, another thought here is that the idea of brass, it's a medal of judgment in the Bible. That's, that's what it represents is the medal of judgment. So here's the idea. Jesus walked in your judgment. That when Jesus goes to the cross, there's this refining and purity that comes through the cross, but it wasn't for him, right? He's already pure. Remember the first vision we saw? His hair, head and hair are white. The, the purity that Jesus walks through in order to gain is yours. It's mine. That Jesus goes through this cross to, to have this refined purity for us. Verse 15, his voice as the sound of many waters. The idea here is like a massive waterfall. That, that as the, the water falls over the cliff, there's, there's power, there's authority, there's volume, there's majesty, it's commanding. That's what the idea here is of the voice of many waters. And so then we come, verse 16, to the second critical image. The first critical image that we saw was the idea of the lampstands. That's the one Jesus interpreted for us in verse 20. The second critical image we see that Jesus interpret is in verse 16. It says, and he had in his right hand seven stars. Jesus points to this as well in verse 20. And Jesus tells us that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. All right, so what does this mean? What's this talking about? Well, the word angels is actually the Greek word uh, messenger. When, when you just look at the word, it means messenger. Now, angels are used by God as messengers, but most theologians would say that this idea of messenger actually means the pastor of the local church. 
that these seven churches actually have seven, they have individual pastors over these churches. They're the messenger, much like how right now I'm the messenger of God to you. Uh, I'm not making stuff up and creating things. I'm just telling you what God said. I'm his messenger to deliver his word to you. And so here's what's happening here. What's happening? Jesus has these pastors and he's holding them in his right hand. The right hand in the Bible has lots of significance. Here's four significant ideas of the idea of the right hand. It's the idea of blessing in chapter, uh, Genesis chapter 48. And there's a blessing that comes through the right hand. There's the idea of the right hand is, is used to choose and select. There's choosing that takes place in Psalm 16. There's strength that's associated with the right hand, Isaiah 62. And there's authority that's associated with the right hand, in Hebrews 8.1. That through all this, Jesus says, I'm holding the pastor with my right hand. Not just the pastor, but the pastor is representative of the whole church. Does that make sense? That it's not just him, but it's the entire church, but the pastor is being selected as the one who's responsible as the leader. Look back at verse um, 16 with me, if you would. He said, it says, he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. We'll get to that in a second, but notice the last part. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Think about that for a minute. He's got seven stars in his right hand, and his face is like the sun shining in its strength. I don't know when the last time you looked at the sun was. Hopefully never. But because uh, it'll blind you. Don't do that. But it's a blinding light. That's the point. It's an overwhelming blinding light. Here's how Charles Spurgeon says it. What do you see in Christ's right hand? Seven stars. Yet how insignificant they appear when you get a sight of his face. They, uh, they are stars, and there are seven of them. But who can see seven stars? Or for that matter, uh, for the matter of that, 70,000 stars. When the sun shineth in, its, in his strength, how sweet it is when the Lord himself is so present in a congregation that the preacher, whoever he may be, is, for, is altogether forgotten. I pray you, dear friends, when you go to a place of worship, always try to see the Lord's face rather than the stars in his hand. Look at the sun and you'll forget the stars. You see, stars aren't that impressive or significant compared to the sun. In fact, when the sun shines, you can't even see the stars, right? That, we call that daytime. The stars didn't go anywhere. They didn't disappear. You just can't see them. Why? Because of the power, significance, and glory of the sun so too it is with Jesus. Now, we saw the, this idea here, but in the middle of this verse, there's a sword coming out of his mouth. Uh, this is not the same word as Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that talks about the word of God being uh, a, a sword. That idea is the, uh, it's like a short sword in Hebrews chapter 4. Um, I'm not going to talk about it. It's a short sword, okay? There's a lot that can be said, but uh, it's a short sword. This one is like a huge broadsword, okay? So, so it's like, think of medieval times, the guy that's got to have two hands on this massive sword. That's coming out of Jesus' mouth is what's happening here. It's exactly the same imagery of the word of God, except Jesus wields it with so much more power, so much more authority, that when Jesus' word is directly from him, gosh, it's, it's so much stronger than if I was to, to wield the word of God or you were uh, in that way. It cuts, it divides, it penetrates. Okay, thirdly and finally, John hears Jesus, John sees Jesus, John serves Jesus, verses 17 through 20. Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. See, Jesus told John to write some stuff down in verse 11. Do you, do you remember that? We kind of didn't look at it too deeply. But verse 11, uh, Jesus says, what you see, write it down. And then John, instead of writing it down, he passes out because he sees Jesus, right? And, and I don't know how you could see Jesus this way and not have the same response as John. There's lots of people that say, I got some questions for God when I see him. And you just have a wrong view of who you think God is, if that's, if that's what you think. You're probably going to have the response that John did. That, that he falls at Jesus' feet like he's dead. He literally passes out. And how does Jesus revive him? Well, Jesus revives him in, in two specific ways. But here's the thing. John was intimately familiar with Jesus, but seeing him this way overwhelmed him. 
He hadn't seen Jesus in this state as glorified God. When Jesus speaks to you and reveals himself to you, the only right response is to lay yourself down and to die to yourself. Just the way that John lays down as dead, so too, that's the only right response when Jesus reveals himself to you. You see, sadly, many people, they have this experience um, of, of having Jesus reveal himself to them, and yet they choose a hard heart instead of a humble heart. It's like this. We're going to put a couple of verses up on the screen, and I want you to just write them down. We're not going to, I'm not going to read them. I'm, not, I'm just going to reference them for a moment. In the book of Acts, we see that uh, two different people preach the first couple of sermons. The first sermon ever preached is preached by Peter, and he stands up uh, in Acts chapter 2, and he preaches the sermon. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, we're told that the people are cut to the heart by the word of God. It's this sharp sword. And what do they do? They repent. They say, what do we have to do to be saved? They, they look for this opportunity to be saved by the Lord. In Acts chapter 7, it's the second sermon that's preached, and it's preached by a guy named Stephen. And we see in verse 54, the same thing happens. He preaches God's word, and the people are cut to the heart. But instead of repentance, they choose rebellion, and they kill the guy. The same word of God, the same effect, but a completely different heart. The question I have to ask is, what kind of heart do you have for God's word? When his word comes in contact with your heart, will you choose repentance or will you choose rebellion? It's the same word of God, the same thing being done. Warren Wiersbe says this, there's a dangerous absence of awe and worship in our assemblies today. We're boasting about standing on our own feet instead of breaking and falling at his feet. And now that John is broken and fallen, what does Jesus do? He raises John up with two things. Number one, notice there, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, verse 17, but he laid his right hand on me. We're back to the right hand, right? A touch from the right hand of Jesus raises John back up. We need Jesus' strength and Jesus' power in order to be raised back up. We can't raise ourselves up. I can't make myself a good man. I can't make myself a God. Godly man. I can't produce within myself the things that I need from the Lord. He's got to give it to me. He needs to touch me with his right hand. And secondly, not only does Jesus touch him, but he calls John to faith instead of fear. Notice there, he said, don't be afraid. And he calls him into faith. Now, in, at the end of verse 17 and then in uh, verse 18, there are three reasons that Jesus gives John for fear to be swallowed up by faith. He says, don't be afraid, but trust, trust in me. Have faith in me. Why? Because number one, verse 17, I'm the first and the last. This is the third time that concept is repeated here in, in uh, Re Revelation chapter one. I'm gonna say it's a big deal. Jesus really wants us to get this concept. He's the first and he is the last. That Jesus is the one who is the same as the eternal, all-powerful God. His dominion and his kingdom has no limits. He's over all. Secondly, Jesus says this, verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. That Jesus here says, I defeated your two great enemies of sin and death. I defeated sin when I went to my cross and I defeated death when I rose from the grave. That this is who Jesus says. So if you, if you have that kind of faith in him that way, it eclipses fear. And thirdly, Jesus says this, not only that, but he says, I have the keys of Hades and death. Now, maybe when you hear Hades, you think of a guy with blue hair from uh, the uh, Disney movie. That's probably because I watch a lot of Disney movies in my family, but that's not what he's saying here. That's, the, this, that's Greek mythology. The idea of Hades is the, the place of the dead, the realm of the dead. And what Jesus is saying is, I have the keys. Now, let me just say it this way. Whoever has the keys has the authority. Does that make sense? I have a key to my house. And, and that what that means is I'm the one who has authority over all the stuff in my house. Why? Because I got the key. Now, one of the things that I do is I also share the key with some other people in my family. And Jesus does the very same thing. He even told Peter, you have the keys 
uh, I'm, I have all authority. I'm giving you the keys uh, to the kingdom. And so it's the same idea. And Peter's the one who actually brings the gospel to the Gentiles. He's the one who preaches the first sermon, bringing the gospel to the Jews in Jerusalem. He's the one who unlocks the kingdom of heaven. This is what that means. And so Jesus says, I've got the authority. I have the, uh, I'm the one who is over all the realm of the dead, and I'm over death itself. What this is saying is I'm in complete control. That's what Jesus is saying. When you understand Jesus as the first and the last, that, that he is alive today, and that he has the keys, what is there to be afraid of? Nothing. There is nothing to be afraid of. You see, here's the thing with these keys. These keys that Jesus has, they're not used to lock people up. They're used to set people free. That's how Jesus uses these keys. 2 Timothy 2, 25 through 26 says it like this. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn uh, the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap for they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. You see, we will only see Jesus as gracious, loving Savior when we understand that we're in prison and we need to be set free. And when you've been set free, you see him as high and exalted over all. Here's how David Guzik says it. Everything in this vision speaks of the strength, majesty, authority, and righteousness of, G- of Jesus, right? It speaks of, his, of this, these ideas. There is an impressive difference between the vision of Jesus and the many weak, effeminate portrayals of Jesus seen today. But the Jesus that John saw is the real Jesus, the Jesus that lives and reigns in heaven today. And so John, he's overcome with this supernatural experience. So what does Jesus tell him? Verse 19, write the things which you have seen, the things which, you, uh, which are and the things which will take place after this. He goes back to the idea. Jesus again tells John to write it down. Uh, and not only does he say, just write some stuff down, but he says, here's how I want you to structure it. And we noted last week that this is our outline for the book of Revelation. The things that you've seen, chapter one. So now John's got to go back and write all the stuff that he saw for chapter one. The things which are, that's going to be chapters two and three, which will start next week. And the things which will take place, take place after this, chapter four and following. Now, verse 20 says this, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands, which you saw are the seven churches. See, here's the, here's the image to grasp in all of this. Jesus is the flawless prophet as God's word speaking God's word. He is God's word speaking God's word. Jesus is the high priest serving God's people. Jesus is the king of kings, ruling God's kingdom. Jesus, as the perfect prophet, priest, and king, is rightly placed when he's at the center of his church. That Jesus is the one who we gather to exalt. His name is to be exalted. He is to be worshiped. The pastors belong to him and must be submitted to him. And when they are, the church functions as it should, as a lampstand. Matthew 5, 14 through 16 says this, you are the light of the world, a city on a hilltop that, uh, that cannot be hidden like that. Uh, one, no one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You see, we don't create this light, we just hold it. The goodness and the glory of Jesus is the light and his Holy Spirit is the oil and the fire that causes us to burn. Jesus has some specific things to say to his church, and we're going to look at that next week. But here's the thing. There's a progression through this section that I want you, don't want you to miss. John hears Jesus, he sees Jesus, he recognizes Jesus, and he falls at Jesus' feet. That's what takes place here. Then Jesus touches him, revives him, comforts him, and commissions him. Maybe you like John have known or followed Jesus for some extended period of, your, of time in your life, maybe, maybe for some years or many decades. And today you need your heart revived by a touch from Jesus and faith in Jesus. Or maybe you haven't, you know, you've been resisting Jesus 
And, and though all your questions aren't answered, you know within you that you need to give your heart to Jesus, that you need to submit to and follow him. And I want to encourage you that this right now is the right time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to close our service, but I want to encourage you to respond to the Lord. That you respond by, by praying to him and asking for him to, to uh, receive you and to, uh, to forgive you of your rebellion against him and to cause you to be clean and that he would give you the strength to follow him. And he'll do such a thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to open it and to study it together. And we pray that, Lord, you would help us to follow you. Jesus, you alone should be exalted. And we want to do that here as your church. We pray in your name. Amen.